Hi, I'm Robert Quimby from San Diego State University, and I'm going to talk with you about preparing for an observing run. So, of course, before you can prepare for an observing run, the very first thing you have to do is get time on a telescope uh, to actually do your observing. Uh, I'm not going to cover that in this, in this uh, lecture here. What I'm going to assume is that you've already gone through that whole process and you've prepared um, uh, a... Um, an application and you've been awarded time on a telescope. And now what it is, you're trying to figure out the best way to use the resources you've been allocated. So some of what we're gonna talk about is actually relevant for doing that first step for preparing uh, a proposal to observe. Um, but the, the again, the focus is gonna be on more of what you can do with the limited amount of time that you're given on a, a telescope. So first thing we need to start off with is just kind of a definition of what the problem is. So we are gonna assume here that we are um, trying to collect photons. All right, so this is gonna rule out, you know, gravitational wave astronomy. They have kind of different constraints and how they plan for their observing runs. Uh, here, we're kind of classic astronomers and we're trying to get as many photons as we can from some source in the sky. Or maybe we have a, a list of targets and we're going down that list of targets and trying to get as many of those as we can in the small amount of time that we are allocated. I'm going to further assume that we're actually optical astronomers. So there's a slightly different considerations if you're doing radio observations or if you're doing um, infrared or optical. So for this lecture, we're going to be optical astronomers. <clears throat> All right, and we're also going to be ground-based optical astronomers. And this puts some important constraints on uh, the problem that we really need to tackle up front. Uh, so there's three big things that uh, are going to be limiting you on what you can do from the ground. There's the fact that there is an Earth, uh, and it's going to block some of the ground below you. Uh, it's round and it spins. So depending on where you are on the Earth and what time, you, what time you're observing at, there's going to be different targets available to you overhead. And uh, the Earth has an atmosphere. So um, there's some big consequences of that. Obviously, during the daytime, the sunlight gets scattered in the atmosphere and you can't observe faint targets. Uh, also, uh, it's gonna, we're going to talk about how the atmosphere itself, uh, if you're just looking at a star at night, the lower it gets, the more atmosphere you're looking through, the less bright the target's going to appear. So we got to make sure we have all those factors accounted for when we're making our plan. So let's start here uh, with a little video. Um, this is actually a time-lapse movie that I made with using some uh, data from cameras at Mount Logan Observatory. So this is a camera that's looking north at the observatory. This is some of our domes there. Sorry about that. And uh, what you'll notice is, you know, there's ground. <laughs> you can see the ground there. Uh, it's getting in the way. It's blocking anything that's below your feet. That's not good. Uh, it's daytime, so the scattered light from the sun is blocking, um, obscuring the stars. But there, after the sun goes down and after twilight ends, you can see the stars and you can see in this time lapse that of course the earth is rotating. So what is over your head and available to observe is changing over time. All right, so these are again, the big constraints. One, uh, you can't see below your feet. Two, uh, you got an atmosphere so that the sun is gonna be uh, interfering during the daytime. And what you have available to you is changing constantly overhead. So we gotta plan in advance to make sure we get our data when we can, and at the best time that we can, because not all times are equal. <clears throat> so let's take a, a slightly different look now, at this video. So this is now a, a look at our all sky camera from the Mount Lagoon Observatory. So what we're seeing here is, uh, it kind of looks like a globe here, because I put on lines of right ascension and declination, but actually you're on the ground and you're looking up and above you, um, this is the whole sky. You can see 360 degrees around and 180 degrees from uh, horizon to horizon. You see the whole picture. Uh, I put a blue line on here. That is the meridian. That is the line that runs north-south. So the, the camera's a little tilted here. This is north on the, the north point on the horizon. This is the south point on the horizon down here. And uh, what these lines here are, these are lines of constant declination going across. And these really are just a projection of the latitudes of the Earth onto the celestial sphere. Um, so at Mount Logan Observatory, we're at a latitude on the Earth of about 33 degrees uh, north. So this line right here, this dashed line, that actually represents zero degrees. That is the um, Earth's equator projected onto the celestial sphere. Uh, and so if we go up from that 33 degrees, that's directly overhead. 
because we're at the Mount Lungan Observatory, our latitude's 33 degrees. So above us um, at, uh, we don't call it a latitude, of course, we call it a declination when we're looking at the celestial sphere, but it, it is a latitude coordinate. Uh, any uh, object that has a declination of plus 33 degrees is gonna go right over our heads. So this is, again, one of the first things you need to know is if you are gonna be observing from a particular site on the Earth, you have to have a sense of where that is on the Earth and thus what the constraints are from the ground. So if we're at the Mount Lincoln Observatory, we have a great look at the pole here. We can always see up north. Uh, things, as I said, at 33 are gonna go right overhead. But if you get uh, to negative declinations down here, 15, 30, 45, suddenly you, you run out of sky. Uh, the Earth gets in the way. So we can't look at uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud, for example, the Small Magellanic Cloud from Mount Lincoln Observatory. It's just not gonna happen. So very first thing you keep in mind uh, when you're observing is I'm on the ground, what's my latitude? And that's gonna put constraints on what you can observe. Uh, now, also there's these lines that are perpendicular to those lines of declination. These are of course lines of right ascension. And these are related to the lines of longitude on the earth. So these are, they're longitudinal coordinates. And the way these are set up is that there's a dashed line up here and when that longitude on the celestial sphere is overhead uh, at noon on the vernal equinox, we say that is the coordinate zero in right ascension. And then every um, hour that passes, we, we have a different uh, coordinate that's gonna be overhead. So we divide up our longitudes that way. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. This is a little bit, uh, this is a movie here, another time lapse. And so you can see the stars passing overhead. They're at constant uh, declinations over time. But they're not always overhead, of course, because there are spins. So you have to have some idea of what the time is. It's not just a matter of what its coordinate is in, in terms of RA, but you also have to know something about what your local time is so you can know what's overhead. And so another way to look at this is to look at it this way. So that meridian now, you can just think of as a hand on a clock uh, going around and pointing to different times. But these aren't solar times, which you may be used to. These are sidereal times. These are the times of the stars. And so if you have uh, a picture in your head of this clock, you'll know that you only have some window uh, over your head that you can observe. And depending on what time it is, you're gonna have different targets available to you. <clears throat> so local sidereal time is a very important concept for an earthbound astronomer. Uh, this is just simply a function of the longitude uh, of where you are, of your observatory is on Earth and what the time is. Uh, so we can uh, set up here for an ob observation at uh, Mount Lagoon Observatory uh, in San Diego. Uh, this is the longitude on Earth for our observatory. This is our latitudes, close to 33, as I said, and this is our height. And so we can set up a location on the Earth at that latitude, longitude, and height. And once we have that baked in, now we can start calculating what the local sidereal time is at any given time of the day or year. So we might take, uh, this is a universal time here. This is going to be a time object. And we'll say on August 20th in 2020 at seven o'clock universal time, which is for our observatory, that's actually close to local midnight. Uh, what is the local sidereal time? And to calculate a local sidereal time built into this time uh, object here, there is a sidereal time method. Uh, we can calculate the apparent sidereal time and we need the longitude. We need the location on the earth and the longitude to, to do that uh, calculation. So with the time and the longitude, we put those two things together and we'll get ourselves our local sidereal time. So at this time and place, the local sidereal time, uh, until it's, this is local to San Diego, it's gonna be different depending on where you, you are on the earth, it's gonna be 21 hours and 10 minutes. So we can use this information to actually start planning our night. So if we know what the local sidereal time is gonna be at local midnight, then we can say, well, if a target has a right ascension of about 21 uh, hours, then that means at midnight, it's gonna be in the best position it's gonna get for us to observe. It's gonna be right overhead. Um, so we gotta have this, this clock in our head and we gotta know that targets are rising and setting. And a good way to, to uh, phrase this problem is to actually think instead of an RA's index, you can have kind of a, a more local observer uh, point of view, which is to look at declinations and hour angles. So our angle is just how many hours west of the meridian is your target. 
So this green line here running north-south, that's again the meridian. Uh, straight up is zenith. The meridian is, goes through the zenith. And as a uh, target goes setting in the west, its hour angle increases. So it goes to one, two, three, four, all the way until it sets. Uh, on the other side, as a target is rising in the east, we say it has a negative uh, hour angle. So uh, it, may, it may rise with, say, minus six, five, four, three, two, one, minus one. And then uh, when it crosses the meridian, it goes to zero. So we got to keep this idea in our head. We got to know what the local sidereal time is. It's constantly changing. Uh, and if we take the, the sidereal time, subtract off the RA, we'll get our hour angle. Again, if uh, the, the right ascension um, is on the meridian of our target, if the right ascension of our target on the meridian is, um, let me say that again. If our target is on the meridian, then its right, right ascension is telling us what the local sidereal time is. And we do want to observe when a target is as high as it gets in the sky. And the reason we want to do that is because we have this atmosphere. And the more atmosphere we look through, uh, the more it's going to block light. And this changes as a function of hour angle. Well, more altitude, but hour angle is related. Uh, so what we're talking about here is the air mass. And this is the next part of this lecture here. We're going to talk about air mass. So we want to minimize the amount of, of obscuration through the atmosphere to a target. And so we have to have some picture in our head of how much, uh, how that changes with um, position in the sky. So if you're lying on your back here and you're looking straight up, there's some amount of air between you and the target you want to observe. We're going to call that one unit, so an air mass of one. And then as you look uh, at a different angle away from the zenith position, you have some zenith angle away from straight up, uh, you're going to be looking through more atmosphere. This is a simple plane parallel approximation, so it's, you know, flat earth, it's not it's not right, but you know, it's, it'll, it'll give us a good estimation here. Uh, so you can kind of see that there's kind of some simple geometry here. We got a nice right angle there. We got a one here. We can figure out what the length of our hypotenuse is. We'll figure out how much air. But the important thing here is that the farther away you get from straight up, the more air you're going to be looking at. And this has an effect on your targets. And you know this, you know this intrinsically. You've gone out and you've looked at the sunset and you said, hey, look how pretty that is. Uh, you've never gone out at noon and looked up and said how pretty the sun is because it's too bright. It's, you know, it's gonna burn your eyes out, don't do that. If you're looking up straight at, at, at the sun at noon, there's less atmosphere to block the light and it's very, very bright. But when it's on the horizon, there's a lot of atmosphere and it makes it darker. Uh, much more dim. So you can see the sun, and, and that'll give you an, an idea of the magnitude of this effect. It's, it's a very significant effect. There's a lot of light that's being blocked as you move down towards the horizon. Uh, there's also a related uh, effect that we should discuss, which is that uh, the color, uh, there's a color dependence in this. So blue light is preferentially scattered, as you may know, that's why the sky is blue. Um, so as the sun sets, its color is actually changing. By color, I mean the ratio of red light to blue light, red photons to blue photons. Those are changing as the sun sets. And this happens not just for the sun, this happens for everything. Any star, any target you want to observe in the sky, as it sets, it's going to get dimmer. And preferentially, those blue photons are going to be uh, scattered away, so it's going to get redder as it sets. So we got to account for these things when we're observing. And at the, bottom, the bottom line is we want to look up overhead uh, at the targets, ideally, so that we don't look through the atmosphere, and so we get as many photons as we can. So we can quantify this effect. Uh, if m is the magnitude of a target when it is when there's no atmosphere, so you're at the top of the atmosphere looking at this target, uh, then you move down and you want to know how bright is it going to appear when I'm actually uh, on the Earth looking through it through the atmosphere. Well, that's going to depend on how much air mass you have. So. Uh, and there's some coefficient here, which is going to depend on what wavelength band you're looking at. Uh, so this is going to, this is telling you here that the higher your air mass is, you're going to start adding magnitudes. It means it's going to get fainter. Your observed magnitude is going to be fainter. And there's also another term here that we can add for that color effect. Uh, the bluer the target is, the, the less um, light we're going to get from it. And you can add higher order terms if you want, but this is a good start here. Uh, we need some typical values there, just to give you some idea. Again, the, uh, the sky is blue. It's preferentially scattering blue photons. So if you are looking at a target that's directly overhead, an air mass of one, you already lost about half of the photons. This is magnitudes here. So about 
uh, about half of the photons that reach the top of the atmosphere got scattered before they got to you. So this is a huge effect. That's as good as it gets in the U-band. It just gets worse as you move over. When you move over uh, from air mass one to two, you've, again, you've uh, doubled the, the air mass there and you're, you're rapidly losing photons. Okay, so let's just quantify this a little bit more. We've got, again, I said a right triangle here. We can do a little geometry here and we can figure out that if we look at the, the zenith angle there, if we take the cosine of the zenith angle, it's gonna be one over our air mass. So our air mass is the secant of the zenith angle. Uh, this is again, just a plain parallel approximation. It works roughly, it's not perfect, but we can use a, a more exact formula if you want. This is one for Pickering 2002. You can put that in, but it's not gonna matter so much uh, for the targets we're typically going to observe. We're not typically looking at things at the horizon where that actually matters. Um, so actually, let's make a plot of these two equations here, put them to work. So we're just plotting now, this is the zenith angle here. So this is straight overhead, and this is the horizon over here at 90, and this is the air mass you have. So by definition, straight overhead, we have air mass of one. And you can see that as you go out to, you know, 20 degrees from the horizon, 30 degrees from the horizon, there's not a huge change in air mass. So kind of anything in that range, kind of 30 degrees within zenith, uh, within uh, the zenith position uh, is pretty much equivalent when you're observing. But once you start moving from there, things get uh, rapidly start getting worse. So when you get to 60 degrees from zenith angle, so 30 degrees above the horizon, your air mass is two. You've already doubled the air mass. And then all you have to do is go out another 10 degrees and you've tripled the air mass and you quadruple it. And then it goes up exponentially. Um, for the plane parallel atmosphere, if it's an infinite, um, if we assume that Earth is infinitely large, then obviously this goes to infinity. But for a, a real realistic, this goes up to about 39 at the horizon. Um, so what this is telling us is we really want to observe targets when they're in this range here. Otherwise, we're going to get this dimming and, and reddening from the atmosphere kicking in. So typically astronomers try and keep targets um, below an air mass of two, which means they want to observe it when the zenith angle is less than 60 degrees. Uh, why do we care about this? Again, was, as we said, the, the, the quality of the data, um, so the, the, the scattering is going to increase with air mass. But there's actually other effects on top of that, which makes this even worse. So we, we get fewer counts. But the seeing is also worse. So there's more atmosphere. That means we're going to get more blurring. The star is going to get puffier and spread out on more pixels on your detector. That means we're going to get more noise. So the larger the air mass, the worse the seeing, the longer your exposure time needs to be to maintain the same signal noise. Also, if you're looking through more atmosphere, that's more sky. The sky does glow. There's emission lines in the sky. Uh, there's also more uh, scattered light you're going to get. So the brightness of the sky, the sky background is going to increase. So you put all these things together and it turns out that, you know, if you go from air mass one to air mass two, to maintain the same signal noise, you need to double your exposure time. And then if you go to air mass three or four, then you really start ramping up there. So practically, once you get beyond about air mass three, it becomes very difficult to observe targets. Uh, you know, if, if you got the, the target you're going to win the Nobel Prize for that's setting on the horizon, like go for it, definitely. But if you have the luxury of playing in advance uh, and you have the option of observing it when it's overhead, get it when it's overhead. Uh, so to do this, you're going to have to plan ahead. You're going to have to know, um, you know, where you are in the world, where your targets are, and you're going to have to have priorities. So maybe, you know, there's a target that's going to set early, but you have this other one that you definitely want to get first. Um, you gotta, you gotta plan out. You gotta know what your priorities are, uh, and of course, you gotta know when the sun is gonna set and when the twilight's gonna begin, what the phases of the moon are. So, is the moon gonna be in the way? It can really ruin your party. It's, it's, a, it's a big bright light bulb out there. Um, so, you gotta have all these things, and you gotta make a plan for for how you're gonna observe. So, this is how I actually like to do my planning. Uh, first, you gotta start with a target list. Uh, the target looks, list looks something like this. So you have the name of your target here, the right ascension, the declination. Uh, this is the, the uh, equinox uh, for these right ascensions and declinations. Um, not too critical these days, but uh, this is J2000 here. Uh, so you have a, a, a file that usually looks something like this with slightly different formats for different observatories, but you know, name R index is, is pretty standard. 
And once you have that target list, we can start looking at where those targets are going to be over time. And so we can start planning out our night. So I can just going to load these into, um, into Python here. I like to use structured arrays uh, so I can keep track of uh, the name values, name RA deck. So I'm just going to use um, gen from text here and set the D type and load in my target list. And then I can take those RAs and decks and just convert them. They're, they're listed in hours in degrees and I can convert them into sky coordinates and then we can start doing things in Astral Pi with them. So I'm going to load all that information in. I got my targets now defined, my RAs and decks. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot them. I'm going to see where are they on, on the sky and it's going to change over time. So I'm going to have a, a function that I can call as a function of time and it's going to know where I am on earth and what my targets are. It's going to show me uh, what's overhead and how long I can observe it. Um, so I'm going to be using hour angles here. I like to plot, make this plot using hour angles. It's not the traditional way to do it. There's other plots available and they're perfectly good. I think there's some advantages of doing it this way. So I'm going to show you this. So for each one of those targets, I'm going to calculate what its um, hour angle is based on the, the LST from the observer, observing time and its RA. So we'll run all this and we'll actually make this plot now. So I'll pick a time for where we want to do our, our planning. We, you know, if I was actually playing this, I'd probably look over a few times, but start somewhere maybe at the beginning of the night. So I'll make this plot here. I'll make it twice so that it moves up. <clears throat> and here we go. So we have now our angle on this axis here. These are in hours. So this is directly overhead, our angle of zero. Uh, and we have declination here. And these are lines are lines of constant air mass. So the blue line here, that's an, air, that's an altitude of 45 degrees with an air mass of 1.4. Uh, orange here, that's an air mass of two. This is kind of usually the line of, we, we want to get it up above that line, higher air mass if we can. And higher air mass being higher in the sky. It's got a weird expression here. Um, and uh, this is close to air mass three here when you're altitude of 20. And so we really want to be above that. Once, once you get below this line, as I said earlier, your, your data quality is going to rapidly deteriorate. So the red dots here, these are our targets. And what I like about this plot is it's showing, again, our angle and declination. Uh, so all we, we have to think about is that over time, all these dots are just going to move off in this direction, right? They move from uh, small arrow angles to bigger arrow angles over time. It's a good way to remember it if you want to get the sign right. And so if I say, what's, what's going to happen in an hour, uh, you can just watch all these targets uh, just move over slightly. So it's going to be moving overhead overnight. Um, so this gives you a sense that if you have a high declination target, you got a, a pretty big window here. You got eight hours maybe that you can observe it. Uh, if you're down here, well, you got a much smaller window over which you can observe it, maybe a couple hours. That's why I like this plot. Once you've got your targets set, you should make finding charts for all these. Um, this is something that's going to save you time. It's, it's best to have these all generated before you even go to the observatory. Uh, in some cases, you might be sending your, your objects to somebody else who's going to do the observations for you. You want to make sure you have a very clear chart. Uh, I've had experiences in the past where you, you know, don't correct, you don't, don't clearly arrow the thing you want to observe and they observe the thing they thought you wanted to observe, which was next to it. So don't go through that problem. Uh, make a nice clear chart. You can put the name on it, R in deck. Um, I'll just show you. This is kind of an example. There's many different ways to make this. Uh, we always put north up and east to the left. That may seem strange if you're used to looking down at uh, like a map. Usually when you look at a map, it's the other way around. You got north up and you got east going to the right. But we're not looking down. We're looking up at the sky. And so when you do that, the axes flip there. So if north is this way, then east is this way. So I want north up and east to the left. Uh, you can tell at a glance that I want the thing in the, in the green crosshairs there. These other objects are labeled because they're offset stars. Maybe I'm doing spectroscopy and the, the observer at the telescope can't see this one. They have to know, well, I can put this one in my, my target slit and then I can offset the telescope by uh, some prescribed amount and move the slit to where um, the target is. Put the scale on there. Usually, uh, historically, people printed these things out, so you want to put black stars on a white background. All right. Um, so we got your finding charts for each target. You got to have a sense of how much time you're going to be spending on it. Obviously, this depends on how bright the target is, how important it is, uh, what your goals are in science, uh, how big your telescope is, how what the throughput is, the the seeing air mass, sky brightness, um, and weather. 
Uh, I haven't even talked about weather yet. Weather can, that can just destroy, that can ruin in your whole party again. Um, yeah, clouds exist and they, they pass overhead and they block light too. So you've got to uh, have an understanding of what your weather is going to be like before you go on your run and kind of plan ahead. Uh, but always have a, f a flexible plan so that you can change your schedule if the weather changes. Um, so you need to estimate these exposure times. Some, uh, some observatories and some instruments have exposure time calculators available. You're lucky if you do. They don't all have that. Uh, you can always go to uh, one of these sites that do exist, like there's a nice one on NOAO for uh, some different telescopes. And uh, you can kind of scale from this, uh, from this exposure time calculator to whatever instrument you're using. So let's say you, know, you have like a one meter class telescope and you have a 20th magnitude object. You can ask, how long do I need to expose? And this calculator will tell you, uh, you know, depending on the band, maybe you're observing the V band, you need to take a 12 second exposure. So uh, if you have a smaller telescope, you can scale from there. Or if you have worse seeing conditions, again, you got to scale from there. Uh, the data you're going to take is not just the data of your target. Uh, you may need to calibrate, well, you probably going to need to calibrate your data. So you want to take observations um, of um, your biases, so not really observations. You want to take some calibration data and take some biases. You want to take some flats. And if you're doing imaging, you might also want to do some standard star field observations, although that's becoming less important these days. If you're doing spectroscopy, you want to do all those things. Uh, you probably do want to do a standard star in this case to calibrate your, your instrument, but not always. Uh, you also need to, to calibrate your, your wavelengths, so you need an arc lamp solution as well. So you have to plan out taking these data, and that's what we do next. Once we know what data we're going to take, how long everything is going to take to do, we can sketch out an observing plan. So here's the way I like to do that. I like to make a text file like this, very simple. I start by writing down when important uh, events happen, like the sun sets, the sun rises, uh, when's the moon rise, when does twilight end, right? So the end of twilight is when you can start doing your, your main science of observing. Uh, this is often 18 degree twilight is what people use. You can actually get a little bit earlier than that, depending on what your science is. So keep that in mind. Um, and you gotta know when the twilight ends. Uh, and then you got to list out all the things that you want to do and put them in some rough order, you know, based on what your priorities are, based on what their uh, visibility is over time, what their right ascensions are. That's a good way to sort, to start. Um, and just, I jot this down very simple like this. And then I, what I do is, you know, I, I make sure this plan roughly works. I, I don't have exact times for every observation. I just have key things like this is the night center. So once we hit that point, that's local midnight, I have to be sure that I've gotten halfway through everything I want to do. So that's, that's, you know, all the time we have for the first half, and this is the time we have for the second half. Um, so you write down roughly what you, the exposure times are, you gotta account for things like you might have to focus and refocus the instrument, you might have to take standard star observations over the night, put all this in your plan, and make sure it's flexible. Make sure that you can say, well, you know, I was gonna get uh, this target here, but it took me twice as long to get this one. So I'm not gonna have time to get one. I'm gonna skip over to this one and put extra time into that. So make sure you know in advance how you're gonna do that. <clears throat> um, so I'll just say again, consider when you're making your plan, the sunset, sunrise, twilight times, the moon and phase, you know, it may not be dark in the moon. It may be a you know, third quarter moon or something that's gonna come up at the end of the night. Uh, know what calibration data you need, have your estimates for exposure times from your exposure time calculation, and plan for weather changes. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there to help you do this planning. One thing I like to use actually is called JSKYCALC. It's a uh, nice program. It's been around for a while. Uh, it gives you this nice graphical uh, display here. You can, you'll have a little GUI like this, so you can put in what your coordinates are. Um, and it'll tell you, you can refresh the output, it'll tell you what the air mass is at some given time. It'll plot it on here, put a little box around your target. Here's your other targets you wanna observe all the night, and this can update over time. So it's a nice tool to use uh, to kind of quickly check uh, what's observable. Uh, of course, these days, uh, we do have um, Python, and there's a lot of great stuff built into Python. So you can, you can make all that yourself pretty easily now, actually. Uh, you can use a lot of the AstroPy tools, but there's also AstroPlan, which is an affiliated package. And this has a lot of, of um, uh, kind of 
pre-baked routines that will really help you uh, plan out your night. So I, I encourage you to look through Astro Plan and it'll tell you things like, how do I calculate those, those sunrise and sunset times? Well, there's some tools baked into Astro Plan that'll help you do that. How do I know how far away the moon is? Well, you gotta know where the moon is. You can calculate that using Astro, Astro Pi, Astro Plan. You can make error mass plots, finding charts, and it even has some tools to do uh, scheduling. Uh, so you can use all this, um, or you know, of course, you can just roll your own if if you're such a coder. Uh, so that's basically a, that's a quick overview of um, how you can plan for an observing run. I hope that helps you getting started out, and I look forward to seeing you for the hands-on session.